Professor Clements with you as we uh, discuss more topics about radiation. And uh, this is a little bit of a blended chapter. It starts with medical applications, but then moves on to fusion and fission and nuclear energy. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and delve into the medical applications. And uh, what we'll do in class, this video is uh, going to cover just the first half. And then there'll be another video with fusion and fission that you should uh, uh, watch. Almost said enjoy. So radiopharmaceuticals. Radiopharmaceuticals. We're talking about radioactive isotopes that are being put into molecules or just the uh, uh, the atom itself, that particular element, would have some biological uh, significant activity and would concentrate in certain organs or certain parts of the body. Um, radioactive isotopes can be used in tracers, both for people and for plants. Why would iodine-127 have the same chemical properties as radioactive iodine-131? This is a, a isotope that's used for studying the thyroid. It tends to concentrate there. Well, if we have iodine, we have iodine, that's the same number of protons, same number of protons, and we have the same number of electrons. We have the same chemistry. The nucleus is different, but the nucleus is not involved in chemical reactions. That um, just gives us our radiations, our alpha, beta, gamma radiations. So we let someone drink this, or put it in some food, most likely a liquid, or inject it in the bloodstream. Um, let some time pass until the biological activity then concentrates that particular molecule that has been tagged with the radioactive isotope, lets that molecule be concentrated in the place of interest that we know where that uh, is located, and then do some imaging, and uh, or not imaging, but detection, and where we you know, run a detector along a person's body and to take a localized measurement of the activity at different places in the body and the uh, amount of activity there can give an indication of the condition inside the body. So would we want to use a short half-life tracer? Well, possibly. The activity is uh, equal to lambda or decay constant times the number of uh, nuclei that are present. If the half-life is short, lambda will be large and we can get a high activity with a small amount of the material. Um, so that would be a, a pro. A con, if the half-life is too short, a lot of the activity will go away before the uh, biological metabolism concentrates the, uh, the isotope in the, in the part of the body we're interested in. So kind of short is okay to give a good activity with a small amount of the substance, but uh, too short would not be good in that uh, the person's metabolism would not have time to uh, deliver the molecule to that part of the body we're interested in. Metabolic half-life is a little different. This would be sort of the half-life in the bloodstream of a particular substance. Uh, the kidneys, other organs are going to filter out your blood a little bit if something strange is in that blood, like a, uh, a new molecule that uh, the uh, physician is uh, recommending for the tracer activity. And yes, tracers can be used in plants. They have activities of uh, moving molecules around in a regular pattern. So that can be studied using uh, radioactive isotopes in molecules that are appropriate for plants. Here's a positron emission uh, tomography scanner. Uh, again, the, certain radioactive isotopes emit positrons. That positron, that positive electron, is antimatter electron. When it comes in vicinity of a regular electron, they both annihilate. They disappear. The mass becomes gamma rays coming out at, in opposite directions. So the detectors and the equipment detect these simultaneous gamma rays and can uh, then analyze where that radiation came from. Um, you know, CT scans have a, a mummy here that uh, trying to determine what the uh, conditions were like inside without doing surgery, without opening up the mummy. So uh, x-ray can be uh, helpful for that. Or there's a neutron source on the end of this boom and it's uh, injecting, letting neutrons encounter materials inside these vans 
As neutrons uh, are uncharged, they more easily get into the nucleus than a proton or an alpha particle, and consequently they can uh, make a nuclear reaction. Those nuclear reactions can create a certain radioactive isotope. Uh, that isotope perhaps will give off gamma rays that the uh, also equipment on the end of this boom will detect, and they can detect uh, materials that should not be going across the border in the, uh, in the equipment. So there's a little bit on medical imaging and diagnostics, a little bit of safety there with uh, uh, the fact that we can put in these radioactive isotopes and uh, use them as tracers. Okay, radiation damage, sort of the downside of radioactivity. Alpha, beta, and gamma, we've called ionizing radiations. We understand they carry a lot of energy, more than enough energy to ionize hundreds of thousands of atoms. Um, if an atom gets ionized, its chemistry is no longer the same. The outer electron structure has been altered. Um, that may mean this particular atom doesn't work well in the molecule it was part of. That molecule may break apart and would change the behavior of the molecules, the, the factories inside our cells. Um, it turns out that the human cell can withstand a small amount of damage. But if there's too much damage in one cell, then that cell will not uh, get repaired, uh, at least not get repaired properly. It may you know, become uh, a cancer if it uh, gets out of control growth because of the radiation damage. Um, there are exposure limits for uh, the general public and then for various careers. Um, if uh, you're working in a, a particular situation, you may be uh, at a little higher exposure level than for the general public. And if you're going into one of those careers, you'll be taking more detailed courses on safety with uh, radiation. Astronauts have a higher exposure limit. This is already a hazardous career, not just from radiation, but the launch and landings are hazardous. Um, and being out in space is hazardous, so they have a little higher uh, uh, threshold. And then uh, radiation dose, calculating the dose, quantifying our risk of exposure. A traditional unit would be the rad, which is 0.01 joules per kilogram. The basic structure of the dose calculation is how much energy did the radiation deposit in a kilogram. So if we have 0.025 joules from radiation uh, to being deposited in 30 kilograms, um, and something happened here. This is not correct. Uh, just hang on a minute. And I got a little overly excited. This is correct. Uh, the number of joules per kilogram, 0.024 joules divided by 30. That's 0 0.0008. But it's not the rad yet. The rad you'll notice here is differ by 100 compared to just joules per kilogram. It's 0.01 joules per kilogram. So I have to divide this number of joules per kilogram by 0.01 joules per kilogram. And so we'd have 0.08 rads for the, uh, the dose for this uh, particular situation, 0.08 rads. Again, to calculate this dose, you calculate straight joules per kilogram. And then you must divide by the 0.01 to uh, put yourself into the rad unit. The better uh, unit that uh, measures the danger from the radiation is the REM. The REM is equal to this rad calculation we just did, multiplied by the relative biological effectiveness of the radiation. Uh, the alphas deposit more of their energy in just a few cells. They're much more dangerous, and they have a high RBE number. Gamma rays, the, the ionization occurs in many, many, many cells. It's spread out. There's not much energy in any one cell, and consequently the, alpha, the gammas have a low RBE, I think it's a 1. Uh, so you'll see there's an adjustment for the radiation uh, that we have to employ to calculate the rim that would uh, tell us our, our risk. Now these are old units, the rad and the rim. The modern, more standard metric units are first the gray, where there's one joule per kilogram. You don't have to do a conversion. You just take how many joules you have, and divide by the kilogram. So up here, this would have been 0 0.0008 grays. Um, there's a direct substitution. Joules per kilogram can be replaced with grays. Uh, so it's a little easier, actually, this more modern unit of uh, dose. And then the sievert is built on the grays. 
the same relative biological effectiveness, the same RBE number is used here, but you're multiplying by grays to get the, uh, the sievert value. So we can calculate and quantify the exposure. Um, so National Regulatory Commission, some occupational limits as far as uh, how many REMs you're getting. So 5,000 millirems, this would be five REMs per year, five REMs per year. And to any one organ, you're different, the skin, extremities. Your eyes are sensitive to radiation to, f to form cataracts. So uh, there's a little lower limit set there for uh, the front of the eye. Uh, a fetus is a uh, baby in the womb is growing rapidly and uh, growing cells, cells that are dividing frequently are more susceptible to radiation, more sensitive, can be damaged uh, more easily. So lower exposure level, uh, 0.5 rems per year, 500 millirems per year. And uh, just overall we want to avoid exposing our society. Um, so. Those are, those are some numbers to think about. Um, this particular graph, first thing, be careful of the vertical scale. This is a logarithmic scale. Notice we're going up by powers of 10 on each major division. Um, so cosmic rays give us some background radiation, background dose um, that's around 0.3. Um, are there any labels on the lines over here? But about uh, uh, 0.3 millisieverts. So we kind of use that as a comparison. Our average background radiation from all sources and I guess from medical uh, sources as well being put into here. Uh, so you know, around four millisieverts. Uh, if you have an abdominal uh, CT scan, a little higher dose. Um, if you're working for the Department of Energy, uh, you have a little bigger limit up here. Uh, if you're on the International Space Station for six months, now we're going up to about 80 millisieverts. Um, if you f sign up to go to Mars, there's uh, we, you lose the protection of the uh, Earth's magnetic field. The International Space Station still has that protection. It's inside the Earth's magnetic field. And if you're going to live on Mars, again, a pretty high exposure. This is a major concern for colonizing Mars. Uh, the transit time, we've got exposure to radiation and living on Mars. Mars does not have a magnetic field to protect uh, people on the surface. It does not have a very thick atmosphere such as the Earth has. To, it's about 100 times thinner than the Earth's atmosphere. So very likely shelters will be built underground for on, on Mars for protection. Um, or at least pile up uh, some Mars dirt over your living habitat. But um, NASA is planning for uh, for these long-term missions and planning how to shield astronauts while they're in space. Maybe you'll live inside the water reservoir of the spacecraft. So this radiation damage, uh, the relative biological effectiveness, again let's get back to that. Uh, if we don't ionize very often, uh, like the gamma ray has a lower probability for interaction, that is less hazardous. Uh, the alphas and even they could put multiple uh, hits, multiple ionizations in one cell uh, is more of a danger that there might be so much disruption it can't be repaired. Um, dental x-rays, they're okay to have. You do get a little exposure. It's not very high, but uh, there's protections made. There's lead shielding on the x-ray machine, so the x-rays only go out in one direction towards the film. Um, you wear lead, the technician stands behind a shielded door and leaded glass. Um, early in the 1900s there were some hazardous uses of radioactivity, you know, things that would glow in the dark, uh, the undark clock. Uh, so dangerous in that these uh, materials were not sealed in, on the hands and uh, could uh, you know, create radiation poisoning. Uh, there are therapeutic uses of radiation, so here are gamma rays being directed towards a tumor. The instrument that creates the gamma rays and sends them out swivels around such that at the intersection there's more of a continuous beam, but around there, each part of the body around here is getting less exposure. It doesn't receive a beam all the time. Um, that's been some improvement in uh, delivery of radiation. Um, food can be irradiated to give it a longer shelf life. 
the radioactive source can uh, kill the bacteria inside the packaging and help uh, the food stay uh, edible longer. This uh, does not create radioactive isotopes in the food. These are not neutrons that are being irradiating the food, but uh, gamma rays. So the gamma rays do not have this ability to create a new radioactive isotope. The gamma rays just destroy the uh, biological uh, material that is that is in there. Uh, question for you, how can you lower your dose from uh, a radioactive source, a radiation source? Well, this technician is giving us an example. Uh, the technician stands behind shielding. So putting some dense material between you and the source would limit exposure. The technician does not stay near the uh, machine. The technician it keeps some distance. So maximize your distance. That will lower your exposure. And then the technician uh, does minimum time um, of exposures and um, doesn't apply because that's the career quite as much. But uh, generally to minimize exposure, just spend as short as time as possible uh, near the source. So that would uh, limit your exposure. So next video will be nuclear energy. We're going to stop with this video right here. Keep reading and asking questions.